Hey there again, it's Dr. Peebler for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Today we are going to be talking about the tumor microenvironment, TME, and the production of lactate. So I keep rearranging slides trying to figure out where is the best place to start. So I decided to start with this. This is an overview of cancer metabolism and the Warburg effect. And just to refresh here, we have glucose coming in at a much higher rate, 30 times more than a normal cell. It's going to go through glycolysis, and it's going to get us to this, this area here, pyruvate. And pyruvate, because pyruvate normally would be going into the Krebs cycle and into oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria, because there's mitochondrial damage or because of the metabolic reprogramming that happens in cancer, What's going to happen is the majority of this pyruvate is going to be transferred into lactate. Lactate is also known as lactic acid. We're going to talk about how this byproduct actually ends up being an important driver of cancer and further metabolic reprogramming and how it's a hot topic within the even the conventional cancer field about how to mitigate this because it has a lot of issues with, in particular, conventional treatment. What's not shown here is how glucose can also be shuttled off through the pentose phosphate pathway and to make other chemical byproducts, which we'll talk about. What also is interesting is that glutamine, which is also uptaked about 10 times more in cancer cells than normal cells, can participate by being metabolized through the Krebs cycle and exported as lactate as well through both citrate and malate byproducts of the Krebs cycle. Needless to say, there's a lot of extra lactate that would not be found in normal metabolism. And lactic acid, being an acid, will lower the pH intracellular. So lactate is then shuttled outside of the cell in order to contribute to the tumor microenvironment. The next thing we're going to talk about is just a general overview of how lactate was once thought of to be only a byproduct of the glycolysis fermentation process but is actually an important driver of cancer. So as it says here, as a consequence of such amount of lactate, there is an acidification of the extracellular pH and tumor microenvironment ranging between 6 and 6.5, which is quite a bit lower than physiologic pH. So it's much more acidic. The acidosis favors processes such as metastases, angiogenesis, and more importantly, immunosuppression, which has been associated with worse clinical prognosis. Thus, lactate should be thought of as an important oncometabolite in the metabolic reprogramming of cancer. And so what this picture is essentially is it's showing that lactate is doing much more than just being the byproduct of the metabolism of cancer and the Warburg effect. It's actually acidifying the, the tumor microenvironment, the outside of the actual cancer cell environment. It's going to suppress the immune system. It's going to aid in metastatic spread. It's going to decrease our ability to kill cancer cells because it's going to lead to resistance in therapies. And it's going to, in some way, act as fuel to nearby cancer cells who still have some, some more mitochondrial function. There's, a, there's going to be a continuum of, of cancer cells that have absolutely no mitochondrial function, and there's going to be some that have a little bit left. And so that can also be used by nearby cancer cells as a minimal fuel source for ATP production. So as it says here that in normal healthy tissue, you have about 1.5 to 3 millimoles of lactate in the extracellular environment. And in a cancer tissue, it's actually about 10 times more, 10 to 30 millimoles. And there's actually a, a, a table in this particular article that summarizes how different cancers have different concentrations of lactate. The other thing I highlighted here was that additionally, it has been demonstrated that glutamine may contribute to a small amount of lactate formation in tumor cells. Glutamine comprise the most abundant amino acid in circulation, about 500 micromoles, representing more than 20% of all free amino acids in the blood and 40% in muscle cells. It was demonstrated that tumor cells require at least 10 times as much glutamine as any other amino acid in culture. So that's why if you ever listen to, to videos by Dr. Thomas Seafried, the cancer researcher at Boston College, he'll say that the most important fuels for cancer is glucose and glutamine. This is just another representation of how basically glucose is uptake by cells. It goes through the process of glycolysis. You end up with lactate, and then lactate is shuttled outside the cell that uses exclusively glycolysis and fermentation and can be uptake to other nearby cells 
reconverted back into pyruvate and then used in the somewhat functional mitochondria as a secondary fuel source. Per Dr. Seafried, I've listened to him in, in several interviews, and he says that even though this process does happen, it's a very minimal amount of the energy produced by cancer cells, and it would have to still depend on glu glutamine and glucose. If you were to cut off glutamine and glucose, this would not be enough to keep a cancer cell alive. This is another, another representation of how there's a, a cancer cell that's relying almost exclusively on glycolysis. The lactate is being transferred to the extracellular environment and being picked up by other cancer cells that can potentially use it as a minimal fuel source. It's another picture of the exact same thing. Glucose is being uptaked, converted to lactate, and then dumped out into the extracellular matrix where it can be used in some small effect. So what happens when the cell the extracellular matrix or the extracellular environment becomes more acidic. So as I see in this picture, it increases the amount of cell growth. It leads to conventional chemotherapy resistance. It suppresses our immune system from being able to attack the cancer cells, even if it's recognized. All of the inflammatory cytokines that are required for cell-to-cell -cell communication get disrupted. It leads to angiogenesis or the creation of new blood vessels so that more blood, glucose, and other metabolites can get to the cancer cells. It contributes to the migration and invasion into other tissues and distant metastases. It will obviously lower the pH as, the, as it becomes more acidic. It will inhibit our immune cells' ability to kill the cancer cells by disrupting the normal immune cell communication using cytokines, such as interferon gamma, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and interleukin-2. This is just a picture of how the tumor and its microenvironment, which is loaded with lactate and being very acidic, is inhibiting natural killer cells, inhibiting conversion of macrophages. It is inhibiting CD4 and CD8 cells, as well as dendritic cells, which leads to the inability for our wonderful immune system to be able to attack this tumor effectively. So this is just kind of a higher level overview, very similar kind of pictures of how cancer cells and dumping lactate to other cells works. What is highlighted in this picture in particular is that lactate is directly increasing reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress, which leads to increased stabilization of HIF-1-alpha, and HIF-1-alpha leads to metabolic reprogramming and further use of glucose as a major fuel source, which leads to excess lactate. So these two, both proteins and chemical substances feed off of each other. And this is this becomes the major snowball effect that drives the Warburg effect and further cancer growth. This is just a picture showing that it's leading to proliferation, angiogenesis, invasion, metastases, and drug resistance. This is a very similar slide showing a very similar thing is that these cancer cells are uptaking glutamine and glucose, which we know it's lowering the pH, it's increasing the lactate. And then that is leading to, it's very small text. I wish I could increase this a little bit higher, but basically it's, it's leading to tumor cell survival, proliferation, angiogenesis, dedifferentiation of our immune cells, and just overall general immune suppression, which leads to us not being able to mount a good defense against cancer cells. So in summary, lactate is the byproduct of glycolysis under the Warburg effect, which is known as aerobic glycolysis, or under normal circumstances, anaerobic glycolysis. That ends up leading to acidification of the tumor microenvironment, immune suppression, leading to metastatic disease, leads to conventional chemotherapy resistance, and can act as a minor fuel source for surrounding cancer cells, which have less damaged mitochondria and have still some level of oxidative phosphorylation going on. I'd like to just reiterate that this is very likely a minor fact. And I just also want to say that if we are able to shut down the excess glucose and glutamine utilization by cancer cells, lactate by itself will plummet. And this kind of ends up fixing itself. But you may ask the question, what about alkaline diets or a way to mitigate the lactate and the acidic environment? And we're going to talk about that in future videos when we talk more about therapies. But there actually may be a role of more alkaline type foods 
and beverages and substances such as sodium bicarbonate, which may help buffer this tumor microenvironment. And by decreasing the acidity, allowing our immune system to actually kind of turn on and work again. But that should probably be seen as a secondary strategy because, again, as we decrease glucose and glutamine, availability to cells and glycolysis basically gets shut down. Lactate will essentially disappear and cancer cells will self-destruct. So until next time.